Welcome everyone again to our webinar. My name is Miguel from InspireTech and I'll be your moderator today. Um, today our topic is um, gain control of unstructured data. So actually this topic uh, came about because we recognize the exponential growth of unstructured data and this accelerated growth actually brings about scalability, flexibility and security challenges to existing data management approaches. So today um, we actually invited um, have the pleasure to invite two speakers and they will be sharing with us how both NetApp and EasyShare are doing different to better manage your unstructured data. Our first speaker we have is actually um, Aaron, our business de development manager from InspireTech and our second speaker, Changkan, the technical partner manager from NetApp itself. Yeah, so over to you, Aaron, you will have the stage now. Thank you, Miguel. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? I think yes, everybody okay. knows this phrase, right? Can you see my screen every time you do a Zoom meeting? <laughs> yeah. Can? Yep, can see your screen. Okay. Right, let me just scroll to the next slide. Right, the pardon. Oh, hold on. Malfunction here. Okay, good. Okay, so um, before I start, the presentation, let me just give you a quick background of the company itself, InspireTech. It is established in 2000. The headquarters here is in Singapore. Uh, we have two sales offices in India and in UAE. And our development centers are in Russia and in Indonesia. So on the bottom, you can see there are four products. The two on your right-hand side here, the Easy SMS and the Rapid SMS, they are a multi-messaging platform. One is on-prem, one is cloud. The one in the middle, Giga Central, that's our tiered file server storage backup solution. Easy share, the one on your left hand side, that's the one I'm going to be concentrating today. Okay, so let me go to my next slide. Okay, so the title of today's webinar is How to Gain Control of Unstructured Data, right? So let me first of all start with the definition of uh, what is unstructured data. Basically anything that does not exist within a relational database, right? So if you think of things like your bank account details, your employee records, your IC number, these there are fields and values across the database entry. And these kind of values you can easily search. So these are not structured data. So if you think about it, as the definition suggests, right, anything that is unstructured, so in a modern organization where there's lots of data, all this data will actually qualify as unstructured data. So things like your Microsoft documents, right, your PowerPoint, your Excel sheet, your PDF, and then marketing department, they'll have their videos, their audio files. And then think about all the communication tools that the organization uses, right, your email, uh, your, your text messages, your social media, your collaboration platform, all these are unstructured data. Now, it is managing this, the, the threats to this unstructured data, some of which actually contains uh, sensitive information that is making it difficult for an organization digital transformation strategy, right? So what are the challenges that is facing these uh, uh, organizations? Number one, so the organization, you need to have a strict security uh, safeguard, right? You need to protect the file sharing uh, and the data that are sensitive and critical. Then next, you need to give the users to the tool to, able to, to enable the, the, the free flow and the sharing of this information, right? Otherwise, they're going to find a work around it, like using a thumb drive or using a commercial grade file sharing tool. Now, providing a tool is all good and well, but the tool must also actually provide a flexible security framework uh, for different file sharing and collaboration scenarios. Example, let's just say, I want to have the ability whereby I'm going to send something to a recipient, but I don't want the recipient to be able to download the document or to print the document, right? So now we 
uh, we know where the problem lies. This is half the battle won, right? So the other half of the battle now is to find the right tool, uh, a tool that will balance the needs of uh, between the file sharing and collaboration and one that will secure and govern the exchange. I now introduce to you Easy Share. Easy Share, if you ask me to describe Easy Share in one sentence, you think of it as a Dropbox, but ours is the enterprise grade private file security solution. I'm just going to give you a little background to Easy Share. So, uh, this was about eight years ago. The Singapore government they wanted a private Dropbox. So our co-founders took up the challenge to build this for the Singapore government. And this is why Easy Share is now the number one file sharing and collaboration solution used by the Singapore government agencies. So as you can, as you can see here from our successes, these are household names to you if you are in Singapore, right? So we got people from defense and technology to finance, to the development boards, the healthcare. And not to say we have no commercial plants as well, right? So we also have got manufacturing. Uh, we also have got education, healthcare, tourism. Right, I'm gonna quickly go into the, uh, the more important question for you guys, which is uppermost on your head is that. So how is EasyShare going to safeguard the, um, uh, the data, right? So we do it on three levels, security, visibility, and control. So security here, so basically what we're saying now is you are no longer sending files as file attachment. You're sending them by HTTPS link and all the files are encrypted. They are encrypted at rest and in transit. And we also have got security measures, uh, some of which are actually requests that came from our clients. Example, the OTP 2FA. So this was a requirement from the Central Bank of Singapore, MAS. They wanted to verify the identity of the recipient, right? So other security features that we have, or actually some of them are more like digital rights management and um, uh, data loss prevention kind of features, like view only mode with watermark, um, link expiry, limit download attempt. I will show you all this later on in the demo, uh, as I believe, uh, as uh, I always say seeing is believing, right? So later on in the demo, you'll see all these features that I'm talking about here. I will help you to visualize basically how intuitive you'll find our interface is and how we would protect the information uh, that is leaving and uh, entering your organization. Now, on the control level here, so basically what we are saying now is you are basically setting the rights and the privileges of all the users, right? And then you also can set security policies. Policies at the company level, group level, and at the user level. The one thing important about control here is actually at the user level, especially now when you're working from home and you're having to do project work example, right? So you can be an owner of a folder and you can share the folders with your team members. And you don't have to give all the team members the same permission. You can give them different permissions. Some will have the right to even download the document. Some will have the right to delete the document, etc. okay? Uh, last but not least, on visibility here, what am I answering? I'm basically answering all the W questions, right? I want to track all the user activities, all the system admin activities, right? So when was this file sent or which uh, IT admin set which policy uh, uh, from which device at what time, right? So all these W questions are being answered here under the visibility. And obviously, there are audit logs and records, uh, reports that you can export out. Okay, so I'm gonna to come to the use cases now. So the Central Bank of Singapore, uh, they have got three pain points. Number one is they need to share large files, okay? Uh, more than 10 GB. Uh, in Easy Share here, we have already tested up to 100 GB and there is not a problem. And in theory, there is no file size limit. Second thing is they are the one who wanted the OTP 2FA. So they wanted, uh, so basically a, you will need your mobile number of the recipient, right? A pin will be sent to the mobile. You input the pin number before you can download the document. And last but not least, very important for MES is um, in this case here is their audit logs. Um, actually, I just want to say quickly in terms of the OTP 2FA. In Singapore here, uh, HDB, they also wanted to verify the identity of the recipient, but they are using SingPass, okay? So we have integrated into SingPass. Um, coming up in our uh, pipeline in the next quarter, 
we're going to have also Microsoft Authenticator and Google Authenticator. Okay, let me move on to the next use case. Uh, MSIG, the insurance company. Uh, touch wood here in Singapore, you get into a car accident, the dash cam will capture a video, right? So with Easy Share, what you do now is policyholder will ring the MSIG to say, I want to make a claim. MSIG will now send a link to the policyholder to upload the video back to them, right? So MSIG can also specify in this case, uh, how big a video file I will accept and what kind of video format I will accept. So Easy Share is not about sending files out. You can also request files in, right? And the last use case here would be with the Ministry of Education here. So in this case, it's more a collaboration. Uh, they use it more for collaboration with all the other universities and research centers here. So as I was saying just now, right? Basically, you're setting up a folder here to be shared across the team. And as, and as I also mentioned, you can set the various permission within this team members as well. Okay, so easy share architecture is actually designed, right? So what we're trying to do is reduce your organization uh, attack surface and protect the, and provide the protection from the outside threats. It is built on Microsoft technology. It has got a three-tier design, the web, the app, and the database server. And we have two types of architecture. You can see on the top right corner, that's the enterprise architecture. This air gap is more widely used by the government agencies where your data is flowing one way from your higher to your lower security zone using SFTP or the data diode. The one on the left-hand side, that's the standard architecture used more by our commercial clients uh, that has got two-way web services API, okay? And last but not least, we have partner with the best-in-class solutions to give you a holistic solution here. So our ready integrations to threat prevention, to data protection, to analytics, they will, add, they will provide you the additional 360-degree security that you need. We also have got REST API to integrate to your business systems. And you can also leverage on AI for your semantic search and also assist in the uh, automated document tagging. Now, under data management, the, as Miguel earlier mentioned, right, the evolving unstructured data landscape, you require a storage solution that is secure, tailored, and economical. So today we have NetApp here. They're going to show you how to drive value to your organization with the right infrastructure for your unstructured data. So from their affordable NAS for file sharing to their petabyte scale storage for big data and uh, software-defined storage. I'm now going to hand over to NetApp. Over to you, Zanka. Thanks, Aaron. So let me share my screen. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I'm going to share with you uh, to do some kind of an introduction of a NetApp storage system for EasyShare, right? As, as I already mentioned, uh, EasyShare is a very good uh, software to manage your file, to con have a control of your file, right? So under layer, you still need a storage to store your data. So where to keep the data? First, uh, I will share with you two uh, scenarios. The first scenario is unified storage for all applications, right? You're in your data center, in your uh, uh, business application, you not only have easy share, you also have other applications, right? How are you going to uh, use a single platform to store all your data other than uh, easy share, right? The second use case will be a very large scale of the managed uh, unstructured data at a scale. So you would like to have a better part of the data, you would like to put a under easy share manage, what are the storage solutions for you, right? So first of all, I would like to share with you unified storage for all applications. As you know, NetApp has been in the market for 25, 30 years. We are uh, one of the very uh, reliable and very uh, good storage system for our customer to run, like you to run applications, right? So uh, our customer typically, you have SAP, Oracle, VMware, Microsoft application or Kubernetes, they need a storage, right? So uh, this piece of storage is uh, 
on premise installed in your data center, okay? Then easy share is one of the very important application, right? Okay, then second, you might have a plan. You would like to move your application in the near future. You would like to move it to public cloud. So uh, our storage operations on tap can be on premise as well as in any of the public cloud space, right? So this storage has been named by uh, Ghana and also the IDC as the leader in the market. Okay, so uh, what are the key features of NetApp uh, storage? So the, the most important of the storage is the storage operating system, right? So the storage operating system running inside NetApp storage actually is on tap. On tap is more than 25, 30 years kind of a development. Okay, so this is the most powerful, most cloud connected storage operating system. Okay, uh, over 25 years, market has tested and the proven technology has been used uh, a lot of uh, major customer in the world, okay? So the key feature of ONTAP, I can summarize in three uh, key characteristics, smart, powerful, and trusted, okay? So uh, the different, uh, I can say different uh, storage model is suitable for your different application, right? So first of all, I would like to introduce AFF. AFF is fresh storage. If you would like to run most demanding enterprise application, you would like to have a, a Oracle databases, SAP together with EasyShare, okay? So AFF or fresh storage is a solution to go, okay? So what? why go for this AFF first? give you best performance, right? So it will isolate your every application. You have a single storage platform to manage. You can do quality of service QoS to define which application will take what kind of bandwidth and what kind of a throughput. So that's the AFF. If you have a tier two application, we'd like to run together with EasyShare in, in the storage side, okay? So we have a hybrid storage. This hybrid storage is have a flex pool. We also have a magnet disk. Why a magnet disk? Because it's for cost effective, right? If you have a large amount of data, you have a electronic design uh, automation, AutoCAD or medical image, you need a very large space, right? So our fast storage is suitable for very large uh, size of the data, okay? And used for all tier two applications. If you, in your mind, you would like to run EasyShare in AWS Azure, or you also have certain application or file, uh, file uh, share services inside the public cloud, uh, we have Cloud Volume on tap. Cloud Volume on tap can run on AWS and Azure, okay? We bring all the enterprise storage capability into the public cloud and can well integrate it with EasyShare. So three favorites, right? One is all fresh, okay? For most demanding application. Second is a fast magnet disk, okay? A hybrid storage give you uh, second, uh, it's a tier two application, uh, it's cost effective solution. Third, in the cloud with cloud volume on tap, right? Okay, so that's our on tap. Then I'm going to share with you uh, manage unstructured data in a skill. We are talking about, as I mentioned, we are talking about petabytes of the data. So NetApp has a storage grid. So uh, storage grid is used for uh, archiving data uh, for new application like EasyShare, or you would like to uh, store your rich media data. Uh, why we propose a uh, storage grid? Because this is a true software defined object storage, right? Is you can define, uh, give this storage will give you a very good durable Durable availability and a skill out. Okay, so you can define a policy. Later, I share with you how do you can you define a policy based on the data inside the system. How long the data has been stored in the system? You can design a policy, right? Okay, 
So we also can do the cloud integration. Uh, it means you can do a mirroring from on-premise data to any of the public cloud. You can mirror from Singapore data center to AWS. So you have to keep two copies of the data, right? We are also able to do a archiving. Archiving means you can store you the, the old data can be archived to AWS Gracia. As you know, Gracia has a cheaper uh, dollar per gigabyte, right? So what is the powerful, uh, what is the powerful behind the storage grid is the, I can see it's an integrated uh, data lifecycle management. It means you can define a policy, okay? You can define a durability. You can define how you would like to store your data, okay? Uh, for example, uh, later I have an example. I have three data centers, Singapore, uh, Jakarta, and Bangkok. So for the first time when I insert the data, I would like to store three copies in all three data center. I lost two sites. I will still have complete set of the data. So I have a full redundancy. I'm able to, I'm affordable to lose two sites, right? But over the time, uh, more than 90 days, uh, I find the data is no more so important. I would like leverage on our policy to define a, a policy called erasure coding. Erasure coding, it means I have a, two copies of the data, the third copy, is basically is the uh, is a parity uh, data, right? So when you have a, the utilization of the space, it's much more efficient. Okay, so you can define how do you would like to store your data. Okay, you can define where to store your data. Let's see, some of the data is ingested from particular user, we are, we are able to define this particular user, this particular group of the data is going to particular data center, like a Singapore user, the data was stored in Singapore data center, we will make a copy to Jakarta, right? For Bangkok user, they can store data in Bangkok data center, but have secondary copy will come to Singapore. So you are able to define Zeus policy automatically when the user have a data ingested to the system, we will help you to move the data automatically, okay? Of course, you are able to set a retention policy. So you will be able to set a policy how long you would like to keep the data. After the data expired, how you want to archive the data. So all those are policy driven. Some of the customers say, uh, I would like to keep the data uh, forever because this is a very uh, important data. Uh, my regulatory requirement is for seven years, 14 years, 21 years, some data you need to keep forever, right? So we have this kind of policy. Uh, you, you can set a policy. You can write, once you write the data to our storage grid, you are not able to modify, right? You will keep a copy. So this is a very good solution for ransomware protection because ransomware is going to encrypt your data and destroy your data. But with our storage grid uh, compliance uh, setting, you are not able, nobody is, can change the data, right? Okay. So that's the, uh, we're talking about a policy to define how do you keep the data, right? Here is a one of the example, integrated lifecycle management. So uh, in my previ uh, previous slide, I explained to you, I have three data centers, right? So, uh, I set a very simple policy, just would like to illustrate uh, how do we define the policy. For the first 90 days, okay, when the user write a, da write a data, easy share write a data to storage grid, we uh, we will always keep three copies, one in Singapore, the second copy in Jakarta, the copy in Bangkok, okay? After 90 days, okay, we will automatically use erasure coding. Erasure coding, based on erasure coding, we are able to define where to keep those data in after 90 days, okay? So I, the erasure coding will keep the data up to 360 days, okay? After 360 days, we would like to leverage on AWS public cloud. So we are able to auto archive all the data to AWS S3, okay? So this is the one of the 
uh, life cycle management example because over the time the data become less and less important that's why when we create first time we create data we keep three copies over the time we have a less redundancy or less uh, performance right okay this is very useful especially you have a very large amount of the data right so older the data you less chance to access it okay so uh what are the form factor how do you implement storage grid in your data center first we have a appliance base basically you buy appliance from NetApp, you can integrate with the easy share immediately you start to use right okay the second you have vmware vsphere uh, virtualization environment you would like to start with small right so you can create a virtual appliance virtual machine to run storage grid to test it out. Maybe you have a one terabyte size of the data, then you should always go start with the small, right? Try how good is the storage grid with the integrated lifecycle management, okay? And also, you have some old server. You don't want to throw away, right? You can install bare metal to your existing server. Maybe you have a Dell server, you have an HP server in different office, different location. You can install Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS, right? Then you just need to install our uh, storage grid software. You are able to build a storage grid using your existing uh, hardware and software, right? So that's the three different uh, form factor to deploy storage grid. Of course, we have a common management interface and an API, right? If you no, no need to worry about the migration in the future, okay, we can define a policy to move the data easily from one form factor to, to another form factor. And those form factor can coexist, right? You have appliance, you also have a VMware virtualized environment, you have a bare metal server, you can join to the same storage grid family. Uh, last but not the least, our integrated data into hybrid cloud uh, data pipeline. Okay, the first uh, you can use this uh, uh, application integrated solution. Basically, uh, the bucket event notification when there's a, a data inside the bucket. Okay, inside the object store bucket, there will be a notification or event trigger to certain activities or certain actions, right? Okay, that's the one of the uh, integration with the hybrid cloud uh, data pipeline. The second one is cloud mirroring. As today, maybe you think about, I keep all my data on premise, it's very important to me, but organization over the time, your CIO or CEO would like to leverage on public cloud because pub public cloud is the way to go, okay? Uh, not necessarily move every single bit of the data to the public cloud, but you have a suitable data. Uh, you have a suitable, uh, the data set suitable inside the public cloud. So you are able to, when you do try to do a migration, you just need to do a mirroring. Mirroring, it means you set the configuration. We will help you move the data automatically to Amazon S3, right? Okay. Uh, once your data grow become bigger and bigger, we can integrate with Elastic Search Engine to search the data. Uh, you know, object storage, the most uh, important feature is the uh, metadata, right? So all the data have a metadata, you are able to search based on the tag or metadata, okay? And we are, we are able to do the archiving, let's say, you would like to keep most important, most recent data on premise in your data center, but some of the old data, you don't want to buy additional storage put inside your uh, on-premise data center because the data center is expensive. Additional storage equipment is also not very cost effective, right? Since we have a AWS uh, or Azure, why don't we use the AWS Azure existing infrastructure? Because you are able to see dollar per gigabyte is very attractive, right? So we can do a cloud tiering. You are able to set a tiering policy. Uh, basically, it's the ILM policy, okay? You, 
you said after 360 days, I would like to keep my data inside, inside AWS Glacier. So you or the, your data more than one year, uh, if the data life is more than one year, we will automatically keep it inside Glacier, right? If you would like to achieve back, your application will always talk to our storage grid. Storage grid will go and retrieve back the information for you. It's transparent to Asia or any of the application. So that's all for my sharing. Uh, thanks. Over to you, Minga. Thank you, Changkan. Let me share my screen now. All right. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Aaron and Changkan again for your presentation. Uh, before we actually move on to a video, uh, in, re uh, in regards to giving you an idea on how both NetApp and EasyShare is integrated together to address your unstructured data challenges. I would like to emphasize that, you know, if you have any questions, uh, there's actually a Q&A button right at the control panel, which you can post your question. So let me kickstart the video. Okay, I have now logged into the admin portal. On the left hand side here, you can see the various function tabs. I'm going to be just concentrating on a few key function tabs today. The first one is the user management. This is where you manage the user rights and their privileges. You control their access to the various folders and to devices. Now, this is the settings tab. Under this tab here, you're basically configuring the rules, which is applicable throughout the whole company. Now, let's just say that you have got certain rules, which is only applicable to a group of users. Then you set up a policy under this policy management tab here. This is the user audit report. Here, basically, you have a complete audit logs of all the user activities, right? So who sent what file? Where did he send it to? When did he send the file? Similarly, I also have got a admin audit report. Here, I'm basically capturing, say, example, which administrator gave what permission to which user, etc. Now, all these logs will help to demonstrate that you are in compliance with the security policies and regulations. Now, I want to show you the most important function tab for today. This is the storage management. This is where you create a storage. Think of EasyShare as a middle layer here. I'm giving you a connector to connect to the NetApp storage grid or the NetApp NAS. Very simple. Click the plus button, give a description of this storage. For the storage grid, which is uh, using the S3 protocol, I just click on S3 here, type the path, put in the access key and then save. So let me just show you the one that has already been created. Here you can see the information of this S3. Now, once you've created the storage, you create a folder. As you can see here, there's one already been created called operations. If I double click on the operations folder, now I'm going to grant user permissions. Who has got permission to this folder? So in this case here, you can see that Aaron Tan has already been granted permission as a owner with the download permission. So if I go over into the user portal here, you can see that the operations folder has been granted to Aaron Tan. Okay, today is a lucky day for you, the end users, because normally you don't get a chance to see the backend of a storage. Okay, here you can see the interface of the NetApp storage grid. This is the dashboard. Down here, it basically gives you an indication of the health of the storage itself. And here it basically indicates how much storage has been used. Under the information lifecycle management, this is where you configure the rules and policies. Much like what you also do in EasyShare, right? You set the rules and policies. So in this case example, you can say 
uh, any files that has been upload uploaded into storage grid is kept for one year and then after one year these files will be archived to another storage okay you might be asking why am i even showing you this interface because i want you to visualize how easy share leverage net app storage uh, whereby the minute you upload the file the file you uploaded inside easy share is actually uploaded inside storage grid okay so i'm just going to go into s3 now to show you my account aaron and as you can see here i have not uploaded any file okay now i'm going to go into the user interface the easy share user interface Aaron Tan, I'm going to upload a file now. Sales invoice. Okay, the upload is completed. So let me go back into S3 now. If I go into the Aaron user account, and you can see the file here sales invoice. Pretty cool, isn't it? Okay, I have now logged into the user portal. Let me give you a quick. Um, Tour. On the left hand side here, you can see all these folders. This is, you have basically been granted access by the IT admin to all these folders and the files inside these folders. On the top here, you can see all these functionality buttons. They are dynamic, it depends on your action, they will change accordingly. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to basically show you how you can collaborate. Uh, with your team members on projects even though you're working remotely and it's not going to affect your productivity and most importantly we are going to ensure that only the right people have access to this right content okay let's start okay let me create a folder called uh, say webinar okay I'm going to upload some documents into this folder I can either do the drag and drop method or I can use this upload button here. Okay, I'm going to use this upload button. I'm going to upload a document called Easy Share Document Test 1. Right? Okay, so now that I've created this folder, I need to share with my team members. Okay, so I'm a right click person. I'm going to do a right click here and click, uh, click on manage, or you can use the icon button here called uh, manage right so let me click here uh, one of my team members is called second party so let me find second party okay what permission am I going to give this second party so down here you can see obviously me being the owner I have all the permissions the difference between author and contributor both of them can do the edit work the only difference is that author you can only delete as a contributor you don't have the delete rights at all okay and as a reader purely you only can read the documents so I'm going to give Aaron the permission as a author now furthermore I can also say do I allow, allow this second party to download the document or not so I toggle on and off and then do I allow this second party to do any web edit work so I toggle on and off right now, as a project owner, if you know the expiry date of the when this project is going to finish, you can set an expiry date to this folder. Uh, you can also set a storage quota to this folder so as to prevent members from uploading any other documents and taking up storage space, right? Okay, so I'm going to click apply here. Okay, two things I can also further do as a owner of this document. Number one, I can set up monitor here. So what do I mean by monitor? Monitor here means basically if somebody make any upload any document to the folder, if somebody change any contents of the file, if somebody deleted any of the files, etc., I want to be notified, right? So uh, let's just say on this occasion, if anybody monitor uh, modified the file, I want to be uh, informed. So I click on monitor. Secondly, I can also say I want to create a workflow. What do I mean by I want to create a workflow? Basically, I'm the owner of the folder, I'm the owner of this file, and if anybody wants to share out this file, they need my approval first. Okay, so I'm going to set this up. 
um, you do have, you can actually create a few owners of this folder, in which case then you must select either all must approve or anyone can approve from this, uh, from the list here. But in this case, only Aaron Tan has been set up as the owner. Okay, so I'm going to apply that one. Okay, now I'm going to log into as a second party. Let me go to the second party login. So let me sign out and sign in as a second party here. You will see that as a second party, because Aaron Tan has shared a folder with you called webinar. Right, I'm signed in now as a second party. You can see this folder uh, that has been shared to you. Uh, it's called webinar and you have been given the permission as an author. You can download the document and you have the right to edit the document as well. So let me go into the folder. So let me quickly show you what I mean by web edit. So I double click on this document. A new browser tab will open and the document will upload itself, right? So this is what we mean by web edit. Um, once, uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually just going to uh, change the color of the, do uh, the wording itself uh, to make the change. So let me go into home here. Uh, I'm going to basically change this color to say green color example, right? Uh, I'm going to save the document. Save the file. Now, before I do that, two things I want to show you quickly. Can you see this little icon here? Okay, basically what it's showing to you is second party has already checked out this document to do a deep work. So all the other team members know not to open this document now because so as to prevent any uh, conflict of version, right? Um, so you will wait until Aaron, uh, second party in this case, has finished his doing whatever he needs to do, check back in the document, and then you can do the edit work, okay? So let me finish this. Uh, let me just close this now. I've already saved the document. Let me close this tab. So what will happen now is when I close the tab, this icon will be gone. And then all the other team members will know that, okay, oh, now this document is now ready for the next person to do the edit work itself, okay? Ah, you can see now, right? The icon is gone because I already closed, saved and closed the document. Next thing I want to share with you quickly uh, is on what we call versioning. So basically, in this case here, there's two versions of the document, right? The original version and the second version, which is the one that I've made the changes. Okay, so um, in this case here, um, let's just say you're not happy with the changes that you made in the second version. You want to restore back to the first version. You can do that. You can download this document, right? Okay, um, let me close that now. Okay, next thing I want to do as a second party is I want to share this document out. So you see what happens, I click share, the workflow approval uh, appears, right? So because Aaron Tan has already set this up, right? He, I need to seek his permission before I can share this permission out. So let me proceed and set up the sharing first. So I'm going to set up as, um, I'm going to share with a person called AT uh, with his Hotmail address. Now, I also want to verify the identity of this AT. So I put his mobile number here. So I say, hi AT, da, 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 the message. I can set expiry link when, how long this document is going to, the link is going to be available for him to download the document. Now, because I want to verify the identity of this AT, I need to toggle this OTP on. Uh, do I want to be notified if AT has downloaded the document? I say yes, right? Um, do I want to be notified? Uh, do I want to specify how many attempts I'm going to allow AT to download the document? You can specify here as well. Last but not least, if here is share with view only mode, by which I mean I'm going to give AT this document, but I'm not going to allow AT to print the document. I am not going to allow AT to uh, download this document, right? If I want to do that, I need to toggle this on. So let me do the sharing. Okay, so second party has shared the document, but before I go and check the Hotmail address, uh, I want to go into uh, Aaron Tan's uh, email. There's two things I want to show you here. Number one is when second party modified the document, right? Because I set up the monitor alert. 
I have now been notified that a file has been modified by Aaron Tan, uh, by second party here. Second one I want to show you is because I set up the share approval workflow. So now the second party wants to share this document out. Do I approve or reject? So let's just say I approve. Okay, now your approval has been submitted. I will now go into the Outlook here. Ah, you can see, right? So the second party has shared this file out to me. Okay, so you can see here, hi AT, the message, and then I click on this link uh, to view the document. Uh, it also specify, right, when this link is going to expire and how many times I've been allowed to download the document. So let me click on this now. So what will happen is, actually, if you remember just now, I set it up as a view with share only mode. So what do I mean by that? Basically, um, I'm not allowing this person to download or to print the document. But before I do that, actually, what will happen now is, uh, if you also remember, I set up the OTP 2FA, right, to verify the identity of Aaron here. So hence, you can see here, it's now asking me, prompting me to generate an OTP. Oh, sorry. There's the this is the security function of uh, Easy Shares. They do not allow you to have too many tabs open, so I do need to sign out here first. Um, let me try again. Yep, general OTP. Okay, so just let me check on my mobile phone for the pin number. Bear with me. Okay, it has arrived. Let me just type in the pin number here. Okay, so you can see here, shared with view only permission. So what do I mean by that? Let me click on this document. What you will see is there is no functionality button basically to print or to edit, uh, to print or to download, right? It's just a zooming bit and uh, fitting to screen, nothing else. And what you will also notice is, um, these are watermarks, these are configurable. You can put your company logo as a watermark. But what we always tell the customer is to put the name and the email address of the recipient. Uh, because basically, let's just say if um, AT here decides to use his mobile phone to take a picture, at least you can see that where you know where this picture is coming from, right? Because uh, AT, his name and his uh, email address is splash across the document. Okay, the last thing I want to demo today is what we call access review. Now this has to be initiated by the IT admin. So I'm going to be logging here in as the IT admin, right? So what do we mean by access review here? So let me just open up the tab first and foremost. Okay. So what do we mean by access review? Access review here means basically IT will initiate this process some company would do it on a monthly basis, some company do it on a quarterly basis. So what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you those uh, folder owners like Aaron Tan just now, right, who shared, who created a folder and share with his team members. Okay, I want now Aaron Tan to review and sign off on these two things. Number one, the people that he's sharing the uh, folder with. Are they still the right people? Has team members left? Has maybe some team members resigned from the company, right? So I need you to check on that one. Secondly, I also need you to, to check on the permissions that you have given to your team members. Are they up to date? Are they correct or not? If not, can you, you need to go and make the changes basically. So what I'm here, what we are doing here is basically I'm giving you the additional scrutiny right uh, from the IT perspective of the uh, from the security perspective to go and control who has access to these uh, folders here so you can detect any any uh, fraud or any errors here okay so the way you do this is you click on this plus button you click on manage folders and then you save so what happens is once you've done that right so um, the initiation process will start but I'm going to show you one that is completed already so basically, once the initiation started, all these folder owners will be informed and then they basically will receive an email and then they have to go through the whole process of uh, checking the review. Okay, now I've come to the end of my demo here.
Okay, this is the end of the video. So now let me switch back to the slides. Okay, so um, we have reached the question time. So I have a few questions being lined up. Uh, and thanks for the question. Uh, this question is actually posed to Chang Kan. Um, one of the attendees actually asked, how can I actually move my easy share files from my data center to cloud? Yeah, so uh, to reset up the easy share application uh, from off, uh, move from on premise to the uh, cloud, I, I believe is quite straightforward, right? So uh, the second part is how about your data? Most important is your data, right? So NetApp has a solution uh, to help you to move your data. So uh, if you are using a unified storage like uh, on tap uh, based system, we are able to have a cloud volume on tap running inside AWS or Azure. Okay, we are able to help you to do a uh, replication in not only the uh, file structure folder, also including all the permissions well keep right so after you move all the data to the public cloud you just need to reconnect back to edition everything will be a uh, work as per normal as on premise mm -hmm. okay ken thank yep. you so much and i think there's another question for you um the attendee asked when to use uh object storage from on tap fas slash aff yeah so uh as you uh, as you know, uh, on tap also have a S3 uh, capability, right? So uh, object storage is the uh, also the S3 compatible storage. So these two, where when to use which one? So this question is a very good question, right? So if you have very small amount of data, you would like to have a unified storage. You uh, you also would like to connect your easy share to uh, object storage for the future growth purpose, right? So uh, you should choose on tap S3 capabilities, right? If you uh, have a delegated storage for your easy share uh, application to uh, store petabytes of the data, you should always go for our storage grid, object storage, uh, object storage because this uh, storage grid is uh, in large scale, right? So in a very uh, simple, uh, not, sure, uh, not sure, in a very simple way to, to uh, determine uh, when to choose uh, on tap uh, S3, only when you have uh, maybe 200, 300 terabyte size of the data, go for, you can go for on tap uh, S3, yeah. That's all. Okay, Ken. Um, let me see, there's actually questions from uh, Aaron as well. Um, what are the key differentiation of easy share from other competitors actually? Okay, so I get asked this question a lot, obviously. Um, so I would say one of the key things that we have here is the air gap architecture that I was mentioning to you, right? So basically, uh, the whole point of the architecture is at no point at all, the public site will ever, ever enter into your internet. Okay, so that's one certain point. The other thing I also hear a lot from our competitors, it's the uh, intuitive uh, interface that we have. Uh, basically, we don't believe in you having to spend time going to learn a new tool to do how to do the file sharing, right? So that's the uh, ease of use. And last but not least also, one of the things if you notice about EasyShare is um, it has also got a lot, uh, not a lot, it has got some uh, basic uh, features of your digital rights management and your data loss prevention, right? So for some organizations who are needing to actually comply with all these uh, requirements, then some of them actually need to go and fork out money to buy the various solutions. This actually can be very, very costly. So they appreciate the fact that EasyShare is not just a file sharing uh, collaboration tool because it has got some of the DRM features, some of the DLP features, because they don't need all the bells and whistles of all the other solution. So for them, it's quite a comprehensive, holistic uh, uh, proposition from the point of view. Hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, I'm going back to Chang Kan. Um, so basically, there's an actually a attendee asking, if we set up fabric pool on NetApp, does EasyShare know if the inactive data already uploaded to cloud? Uh, fabric pool actually is way auto tier 
cold data to object storage automatically. So it's transparent to Easy Share. So there's no changes, no configuration in Easy Share. So Easy Share oh. will not know where is the data block being moved to uh, object storage. Yeah. I see. Okay, Ken. Uh, as we are approaching the time, um, I'll have one last question uh, from the attendee to Aaron. So hmm. this attendee asks, is there actually a file size limit in ah, EasyShare? Yeah, so as I mentioned just now, so basically we have tested up to 100 GB actually. So I, we used our fastest internet we can find. So tech, that took us about an hour and a half to upload a 100 GB file. So in theory, there is no file size limit. You can upload whatever size file you want in EasyShare. Upload and download actually. Hmm. Okay, Ken. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, Hey Miguel, there's one more question in the mm. chat. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, in the chat. Uh, okay. Uh, Ching Fa asked, can you migrate ONTAP S3 to storage grid or both platforms are compatible with each other? I think, Zhang Kang, you mentioned it's compatible, right? Yeah, so, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, when I reply, I just replied to the panelists. I didn't yeah. reply to all attendees, right? So I just yeah. would like to answer here. So the... Uh, on tap S3 and the storage grid uh, of just storage are both are compatible because both are S3 compatible storage. Yeah. Okay, Ken. Thanks again. So uh, thanks again to our speakers. Uh, we have finally reached to the allocated time. And after the webinar, you, you all will be actually re redirected to a feedback form. And please help us to fill out the short survey. And we appreciate every feedback. And if you have any further questions for our speakers, you can actually type it in there as well. Thank, thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.